And welcome to the risk working group. So far, it is just myself and Michael. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, we stuck in the link to the MVP doc in the notes, if you're in the notes doc. Trying to remember how we got here in the first place. There were so many conversations and various permutations of the same information. Yep. Uh, so I guess looking at this, we already have a list of MVPs. So I guess if you haven't reviewed it, I'd love to get your feedback on, oh, Vinod's here. Hello, Vinod. Um, I guess I can present too. That would probably make it better. Yeah. In terms of being on the same page. Hi, Vinod. I am a very disorganized meeting host. Sean is not here today. And do you need any help for meeting minutes? I can share quickly. Um, yeah, I was just pulling it up. Um, are you looking at my screen? Yes. Okay, so the, I was telling Michael Vinod the guidance I got with from Sean was working through this MVP doc. Um, he didn't really share other guidance beyond that. So my interpretation was looking for holes, augmentations, and potentially filling out some of these submetric questions. Um, would you, Vinod, in, interpret that guidance any differently? So these are the goals we have, and we have to like uh, maybe think on the metrics we can develop around those things. So what are the metrics that we can use to um, like assess these goals? Or that's what my understanding is. Okay, so beyond the description and say column B, having a specific thing to measure. Yeah, so like maybe, a, okay, a repository dependency enumeration. Can it be a metric? If it is, what is the question that I, I can answer with that will be a thing. Then over there, the, if you have a question, then we can think through developing a metric. So okay. maybe, maybe I would say like, uh, we can give a, uh, like for a short break to this. And since I have worked on that, uh, we all have worked on that dependency metric. We go through that, keep that in mind, and then we can come back to this sheet and look at this, like this particular metric is almost finished and it just need a proper read that it's fine. And then we can go for it. Okay. Do you have that handy? Because I would. Yeah, make if it you fair go to the agenda point two, like I have pasted the notes in the minutes, uh, meeting notes, and it's the agenda number two. In the risk working group notes? Yes. I don't see that yet, unless it's from yesterday, last week. It is. Uh, oh, I see it. Okay. Yeah, it's in the agenda number two. And uh, yep, this is the document. So th this is the document we all have been working on, right? So we have this metric upstream code dependency. The question is what projects and libraries my project depend on and the entire metric has been developed. So now this is like in a refined shape. Does it answer all these things? And is it ready for the release? Similarly, we can take this format and uh, look at the uh, spreadsheet shown as here and then okay what uh, particular metric that I can develop and address a particular problem or a situation I get I get what you're saying I feel like in practice I'm unclear exactly how to act on it so I think like the first thing my reaction is the sub question is 
what projects to my project depend on, but that's already kind of repetitive to what's in the block. Yes. So like a uh, repository dependency enumeration, that's my pro So I think we have already covered this point one in this sheet, which is, which is this particular metric. So if anything, then it's really just. Yep. So, <laughs> yep. So we have already covered this. Maybe we can think on the point two, what is dependency sustainability risk? Okay, now I'm trying to remember what this was. Is sustainability defined in other working groups? Do we know? No. No. No, I'm not that I have been involved in three working groups. I'm not sure. It has not been defined anywhere. Well, Sean and I just met a professor yesterday from UC Davis who submitted a paper or just published a paper about project sustainability. So I literally asked him this question yesterday of how they define sustainability. Um, and the way that he got around it was particularly in their project, they're looking at, at graduation rate within the Apache incubator program. And so for them, sustainability of a nascent project was defined as su successful if they were able to be graduated from it versus retired or discontinued. So it wasn't actually a definition of sustainability. It was a definition of whether or not the Apache incubator foundation felt that the project had enough momentum to be inoculated into the into the foundation inoculated is not the right word but assumed so the, the way that I've, I've, I've defined sustainability in the past has been related to kind of project health which is you know uh the the, the likelihood that the project will continue to meet your expectations at some point in the future um And that way it's super general and you you can say, well, what does that really mean? And what data are you using to infer that likelihood or, or calculate that likelihood and, um, and things like that. But certainly a project that hasn't been touched in 10 years is not likely to be touched in the next year, just kind of anecdotally. Um, and therefore, if it breaks, there is no one there to fix it. So mostly, I guess in the context of dependency to sustainability, it can be a narrower definition. Um, I guess to your point, sustainability is about meeting expectations of, in this case, the project that depends on it. I guess we put it in that mm -hmm. context. So yes. then in that case, we're defining sustainability as just what we depend on. <laughs> We want to make sure that that piece continues to be a viable piece of code that we can reference in our software. So to your point, things that would indicate that would be age, when was the last time someone interacted with it? Is there anyone still supporting the project that would be able to handle break fix? So I'm writing this in the notes versus in the slide, the sheets, just because. Yeah, that's what I felt like it was difficult in keeping points in the sheet. Yeah, boys, it's just, I feel like the sheet is a great place for the summary, but not a great place to capture the thought progression. Yep. Um, have you guys seen the, the um, OpenSSF criticality score? Mm -hmm. So I feel like that, at least the, the, the descriptions of the elements that they use and, and, and why they think that you know, com, uh, a higher commit frequency, um, you know, infers more importance to the project and a, and a more important project should have more, uh, be more likely to be maintained and things like that. Um, I mean, that's also something that already exists as a tool too. So right. I think that's easy enough to reference if you're having trouble defining what the sustainability elements 
are important for you, then this is one you can start with and change to meet your needs. Because yeah. it has updated, created, contributor, size, frequency of commit. Yep. It's pretty comprehensive. I have looked at this, it's just been a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So the name is Dependency Sustainability, right? So then the metric itself is just somehow measuring the, some sort of aggregation of risk against or sustainability against all of your dependencies or you, would you be measuring it per dependency? Sounds very cumbersome if you are. I, I think you need to aggregate it over the whole transitive graph of that dependency. So, you know, I, I so, so some of my sustainability risk, my sustainability risk derives from my direct dependencies who their sustainability risk derives from theirs and so on down the chain. Um, and then you have this, this giant aggregate up at the top. Um, uh, so, you know, the question, so, so a question is like, okay, your uh, uh, dependency sustainability drives from a direct dependency, but there is a sustainability issue with the like transitive or second order dependency you have the flexibility or option to fix that dependency. Uh, Do you though? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, for example, uh, you, if you look at the image, like uh, uh, if Sophia, can you open that Rix up the stream uh, tab? Oh, which one? Uh, the risk upstream code dependency tab uh, like in the browser yep scroll down there to the image there is a image like mm -hmm. circular image in there go down one more one more okay on this one circular so our project depend on project a and on project c and project c depends on project a too so if there is a issue with the project a i'm depending on c c is also so I can fix A or C can fix A and we can all live with it. I mean, it, yes, I, absolutely. But at, at that point, C has forked A and it's no longer A. It's this other thing that C has created or you forked A or worst case, both you and C have both forked A. And now, I mean, I think that the probably breaks the, breaks the dependency, the circular dependency. Um, in, in my experience, asking teams to fork and change a, a transitive dependency um, is almost, it, it's not quite the nuclear option, but it's its like the last resort um, okay. in a lot of cases, because especially if they don't, like if, if the, the happy path is, yes, you do that and you submit a pull request and they accept it and everything is happy. The bad path is, no, I fork it, and now I've now now it's mine forever. Um, so so yeah, I, I, of of course you can. It's just code. You can go in and do whatever you want, but I, I think it it's. Um, it, it, you so you you often generate more risk than you mitigate. Um, okay. Yeah, I was kind of just thinking through the, the remediating options that you just mentioned. So it's sort of the, okay, let's say you find out that something is more or less risky than your options are to try to address it by either contributing to the project, submitting an issue or a pull request, um, trying to remove the dependency entirely in terms of ripping it out if you can, or three, forking it to make it suit your needs, but then you're also kind of assuming responsibility over the fork. Yeah. So I'm assuming that's sort of like the, the worst option out of three, but maybe the least disruptive, depending on what the issue is. Yeah. I, I think there's probably actually a fourth, which might be, uh, it may just be a rabbit hole. So I, I apologize in advance. Um, but 
in in this case, um, well, let's say let's say it wasn't the circular dependency. Let's let's say it was it was I think the, the one up above, the, just the, the base. The transfer. Transfer. Yeah. So yeah. imagine that if you if you kind of project a coal graph on top of this, you see that there is actually no path of execution from our project to dependency C. And yet dependency C has a vulnerability. You can assert pretty, to a pretty high degree of confidence that that vulnerability is, does not impact our project. Um, and therefore you don't need to do anything. The, 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 the risk is kind of, uh, and whether it's a sustainability risk or, vulner or vulnerable or, or any kind of thing, it's non-impactful. So as you go down the, if you, if you go through the transitive graph, the further you are away from the root yep. application, the, like the, the uh, accumulation of that risk kind of goes down over, goes down with the length of it. So is it like, okay, I'm using project A, but within project A, I'm not using the module which project A is depending on C. Uh, it, it, it could be that, or it could be that. So, so imagine that, that uh, dependency C has uh, one function and the function has a, you know, it, but it's, it'll, let's just say it's dead code. It's, it's not referenced anywhere and it has a vulnerability in it. Then A is not affected by it. Neither is our project or anybody else that uses it. Um, right. Similarly, if C, you know, there's a whole section of C that's vulnerable, but A only depends on one function that is self-contained and isn't vulnerable. Okay. Similar, you know, so. Um, the, the problem is that's a very expensive operation to, to an expensive calculation to, to, to make. Um, but it does go the other way because on, on one hand, a lot of the metrics um, are about this is more risk that you have that you didn't realize. And it's kind of, it's usually about bad news while saying that this doesn't affect you is good news and people like that sometimes. So you, you've, I think through that, you touched on two areas. One, sort of this question of whether or not the further you get from the root is your risk actually going down? So that should impact the, the way that we choose to aggregate or treat some of the say far down the tree transitive dependencies. But I mean, there's also the corollary where like, I'm assuming it really just depends on context where like, depending on how far out you go, if it's all one language library that gets taken down, then that's fairly sweeping depending on the nature of what it is and what else in your project depends on it. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, um, uh, and similarly, as you go down the tree, there's more at, there, there are more dependencies at level n plus one than there are at level n. So, yes, the 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 risk of each particular one is less. The aggregate risk of that level might, I don't know. Um, I, I feel like there there has to be an academic paper like to be written about this, but I, I haven't yeah, come across one. It seems ripe for exploration because I'm thinking of sort of the, the M plus one model, but then it's sort yep. of like how how often are things coming up? Because if it's say there's 20 more now at level three, but if in that list there's overlap with another tree in the other part of your software, mm -hmm. then that should be escalated more than anything else in the tree because it has a higher level of impact. So I guess it's I guess what we're talking ourselves into, and that's sort of the second point you were making, is how to put some, how can we measure relative impact? <laughs> Which I think is a really hard problem. Um, but in terms of say, you mentioned partial dependencies. So say right now there's, even with something like using criticality score, it's measuring across the entire project, or even vulnerability assessments are measuring across the entire project. And if you don't use the entire project then that risk, might may or may not be as important for you to consider or whatever issue is with the, the code base. So is there a way to actually delegate or at least specify um, sort of area of impact within a project? Which I, know I called it partial dependence, which isn't yeah. great either, but like, or maybe that's the assumption is we can't do that. So it's just gonna be 
estimating no matter what? Um, I mean, I guess you really want like a heat map of control flow. So you see, like if you like look at the look at the source code, I guess, and see that you know here that like all the hot spots start at like the entry points, and then they flow out and get less over time as. Although you you probably need the thing to exercise the thing in order to to drive that, otherwise you don't know what's getting called. Um, but yeah, there's definitely parts of a component that are more important than others, or more likely to be called or possibly called. Well, so then it's there in these in the data you should be able to see the specific folder structure and calls. Like I think it's not just calling a project. Like if it's calling a GitHub repository, it's your, you can see the full URL of the call. Sure. So in theory, we should have some information that specifies what area of the project. The thing that I don't know is if we can measure, say the criticality score for subcomponents. Probably not because I think the, the well, the criticality score as like the, the implementation, the project idea, the, the, the project. Um, no, I think that's all against a repo, like in general. So it's not even against a particular tag or commit or anything. It's like, this is the, the general repo. Um, um, you can build a tool to measure it. I mean, I think it would be, be an interesting idea to like, how would you look at? Yeah, yeah. How how would you look at the at, at the the flow through and kind of it's almost like like tree shaking where the the you know you you start with that and and you you eliminate everything that like is never called yep. and then you take a step back and you say well what are the things that are only accessible from one you know through through one control flow thread mm -hmm. um, and then. This is a fun. This is a this is a fun fun project idea. So, is it calling same in every language? Like I, what to my knowledge is like you call entire library in certain language and you call certain function within that library in a certain language. Not so the pattern is not same in across all the languages or all the development environments. It it wouldn't be either, and it would change depending on what you're calling like I'm, i was thinking like mostly i've worked with build file dependencies so then it's specifying a specific file that it's referencing or something that's mentioned in that file which mm -hmm. does have a specific location in a project because it's then you have to know where it is <laughs> um but that to your point if you're calling a language library you're calling the library yeah. even if you're not using the whole thing well you're including the whole thing but you still you know even if i include the the uh, i don't know the java runtime or, or or something and i write to the screen something that's gonna there's an entry point for that function it'll go there and then it'll do whatever it's gonna do to like get the text on the screen um for like npm you know you have to explicitly export the functions that you want callers yeah. to be able to call. Similarly for C and C plus, like there's, um, it's different for each language. But I think, I mean, the only languages that don't really do that are probably the ones that are. It's just a blob of source code, and it now it's yours. Um, but I think that's. But uh, but I feel like in every language they. They call the entire library, but within the in, uh, inside the code, they call a particular function within that, and that will determine whether you're using the entirety or you're using a particular section of it. Yep. Well, uh, yes, yes. That, that function gets to decide, obviously, like what it wants to do. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think that the key is that not all parts of a prod of a dependency. Um, are accessible through the defined entry points. And it's really hard to get 
into a library, not through one of those entry points. So, you know, if, if um, um, I mean, they, 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 they go like, like a, about a, a web server, you know, or an app, just a regular like web app, like talks to a database on the back end, like you can't from a web browser, like connect directly to the database through the app. You can only go in through the, you know, whatever routes and entry points yeah. they define. So if I had a dependency on a database, but never actually made any calls to it in my, in my web app, then it, it's kind of uninteresting. Um, and therefore risk of the database wouldn't propagate out to the, to the app. So I guess out of all that, um, that last point, I think would probably start to discuss the kinds of parameters we'd want to include that would change the weighting. So you said yeah. number of calls to a specific dependency. Um, I don't know if we want to get as specific as the kind of dependency, because I don't, again, I'd, I don't know how easy that is to enumerate with the given data. I know Sean had mentioned up front, we're thinking about what's in an SBOM. I think there are a few other tools that we could consider in terms of say package managers, but, and aggregators that are looking across package managers. We just launched one, but I don't, I haven't actually used it that much to say what it's good for yet. Um, so I, I'm assuming Michael, you're on the call about the open, in, open source insights tool that we launched a few weeks ago. Uh, no. No, oh, I'll, I'll share that. Yeah. So I think that's also, it combines abuse across package managers as well as bringing in top line vulnerability. I believe it does that, or maybe I'm talking about something I saw that I shouldn't be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> this is being recorded, so don't listen to that. Oh, good. <laughs> um, you can pause recording at any point. <laughs> <in time. laughs> I know, like, before I talk about it, I know too much. Um, but I'm thinking yeah. about um. Just, yeah, you can pause and then share, and then once you're done, you can re-record it. <laughs> uh, well, it publicly says there's plans to add more data sources, so it's meant to be an aggregator, um, so right. that you're not having to query multiple places to see dependencies against one thing. So it's another tool that you can reference. Um, but in terms of say, bringing this back to a metric, um, so I know we're getting yeah. on to the last 10, 15 minutes of the call. Um, so so yeah. fr from this discussion, I can take an action item that I can convert this discussion into a, like some narration of a metric, and then we can, in the next meeting, refine it and go through it. Sure. So yeah. I was looking at just the rest of what's in here, and I yep. feel like we kind of covered numbers three, four, I guess not five. Five is different because it's vulnerabilities. Yeah. But I see metrics, proposed metrics three and four more as contextual add-ons to the others. Yeah, it's versus like a filters within first and second. Yeah, so I, I don't know how much we've done that in the past in terms of say, here's a metric and then here's the like, the subtext metrics that can help to provide more actionable insight onto what we have referred the metric like if it is a developed metric we have referred it okay uh, we are using uh, like in this metric this data can be used to in this context and we refer to that particular metric if that is a release metric okay yeah but i don't think in terms of dependency we have any metric that is released and we can refer it to it. we can say okay these are the filters we can apply within it that's what we are trying to develop so so this one which i have like refined it everybody has made their comments and everything is there so i've just refined it it's ready for it like it just needs a review does it make sense is it okay then we can release it as a metric so this is for the upstream dependencies one yes okay I mean, this looks pretty buttoned up at this point. Yeah, like I try, I spent one hour extra, like just thinking through the refining the language and everything. So maybe we can read through it. Does it have any things that needs to be addressed or anything? I just have one comment in that. I was not sure. That was on the. Uh, yeah. 
It's pretty comprehensive. I feel like it got thicker since I looked at it last. Yeah, there is a, a tool for software bill of material that was mentioned. I was not sure which tool is that. Do you know any tool that major software bill of material or anything? I think Cyclone DX just released one, but then SPDX, I think we're waiting for SPDX3 to solidify. Um, so that, is it a tool or is it, I know SPDX is a standard, not as a tool. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, actually, so, uh, I actually, I do know the answer to this. Uh, so correct. I think Cyclone has a tool that they released a couple of weeks ago. Can you um, share the link or anything if you have? That'll yes. be helpful for me to like, like finish this metric. Like, okay, this particular point, I'll cover this. Yep. You know, I'm not sure if this is the, this is the general one, but I'll I'll post this in the chat. There's probably going to be a bunch of tools in the um, S bomb generation space popping out over the next six months. Create S bomb, yeah. It, it, so it is saying it will create S bomb for Alfine and Devin. Uh, so for these distributions like of the Linux. Yeah, so this will work as a reference point. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm, I, I, I hope it's not super tightly coupled to yeah. like. Okay. So. Wow, it took me way too long to find the chat as the meeting host. <laughs> I have so many more buttons. It was like hidden. Okay. But you, I'm assuming you got the link then, Vinod, because it took me yes. like minutes to find it. Okay. I've resolved it like, okay. <laughs> minutes ago. Okay. Yep. This is the one. Yeah. Because I, I was aware that SPDX uh, guides you on the software bill of material, but it doesn't provide you a tool. Augur has a tool that looks at the project and says, okay, what are the licenses or things you are using? But I was not sure on that. Wait, so you're talking about licenses now in terms of what this stands for? This, I was looking for a tool for the software bill of material. Like, is there any tool that provide you the as bomb. Yeah, right. So I, I think what I think what you're are you, are you looking for like a combination of like dependency check to like do the enumeration as well as instead of emitting it as a text file, emit it as an S bomb. Hmm. Not sure. I was just looking for any are there what are the tools available that can help you to Look into this bomb. Uh, yeah, I, honestly, I've, I've been asking for those tools for for quite a while. Okay, uh, I never really get great satisfactory answers. Um, okay, <laughs> but I'm I'm told they exist. It's just, um, yeah, this is about. Cyclone D. It seems like Cyclone DX has the uh, you know they're they're, they're releasing yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, Cyclone DX Tool Center. What it? Uh, really, no help on this front. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Here. Uh, 
that second link. So if you wanted one for, for Python, there's a, what does this do? I wanna make sure this actually does what I think it's gonna do. Um, oh, it works. So the second one is the S bomb. No, that was type cheat as bomb is studio. I think uh yep, this is the link. Yeah, this is the like right link for this metric, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like there are special ones depending on the language or the, the package manager. Yeah, this so is I good. That, I yeah. like that it has a broad selection of cases. Yes, like you, whatever context you are looking for in terms of SBOM, you can find a tool in this. Yep. yep. Okay. So I it's think- interesting. A, a lot of the tools are really, really simple. Um, so I don't know, like it, it's certainly a good place to start, but um, I have a feeling that as it mature, like, I don't know if the tools will need to be significantly changed in order to be useful. Um, from what I'm looking at, it, it's it's basically just a text file of, of, the, um, of the of the dependencies. Oh, maybe. Or, or that's like JSON or something, but it's not. Um, Oh, I guess you know, it has hashes and licenses. Okay, yeah, maybe I was wrong. Maybe it, it does have more. I've got to, I've got to test this out. Yeah. Maybe this metric is, I guess, ready for the release or any thoughts or any suggestions that I can like, take this as an action item and create a pull request for the release. Or maybe we wait for one meeting and let uh, other members join and they can just take a quick look and then we can release it. I think more eyes is yeah. never a problem if you're Yeah, okay. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. So I think this is getting really close. I'm just right now I'm thinking about how this is really sort of the central metric around dependencies and to your yes. point, this is live, then it'll be easier to build on it. Cause I see something like the depend the sustainability of your dependencies as a submetric that builds on this one, because this one already still has a lot of the base components that we would need to measure the second one yep. uh, in terms of being able to enumerate all of them, being able to identify yep. what kinds of dependencies they are um, in terms of direct, indirect, static, dynamic, all of the different types of contexts that we have listed in this. So yep. I think once that's live, then we can refer to it versus having to rewrite it. Um, yeah. And I'm also thinking now about our conversation around the second one. What is net new that isn't included in this for that sort of next metric? If you are thinking in that, um, uh, I would say if you look at the notes we have taken and this metric. <laughs> I kind of see it as a proposal to refine it. <laughs> okay. But maybe that, that's not what it should be doing. Like, so say the first one is just what are all the things that we depend on? Yeah. And then the second one is, okay, now that we know we depend on how what do we, we care to know yeah. within those dependencies. And so it's sort of, again, I think we would, we're going to have to define what we mean in terms of sustainability here if we use that word, or we just don't use that word. And we say something more specific that relates to long-term viability of the code or however we want to yeah. call it. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, yeah, it's kind of just thinking that because I feel like a lot of what we were discussing was just how to, what else we would want to know that would help to make just a list of projects much more actionable. Um, well, I think we've sufficiently widened the net again. Uh, <laughs> uh, Michael, I don't, you've been with us for a few months now. That's why I'm here. 
<laughs> general like trend in this group is that we have a problem and by the end of the meeting our problem is generally bigger than we started with <laughs> absolutely that's the way it works <laughs> i mean is that how dependencies work right you just keep finding more yep, yep. yeah but like uh, now at least looking at all the discussion being converted into a metric is helpful like okay this is the goal like we wanted to have at least Um, well, that was the agenda for the meeting. So yep. we, we are to... almost at time. Is there anything else you want to add or share? Yeah, uh, you're good. Have you guys been hearing my lightning storm in the background? No, not really. Oh, that's a shame. It's quite loud and exciting for me. I'm in New York City and we are in the middle of thunderstorm season. I was thinking why your background is so dark today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the sun is obscured and um my my floor lamp died this week so I only have a desk lamp. <laughs> oh. I, I I feel like you are at, at the like nighttime zone somewhere. <laughs> well, it gets it gets pretty dark when the storms come in, so this is this is where I am now and I took my partner's lamp because he went into the office yesterday and then he came back today and he took it back. So now I'm working in the dark. <laughs> it's really my problem, but I don't mind it that much. I have a desk lamp. Um, well, I guess we can end the meeting then. Uh, thank, thank you, you for everyone. sharing. Thank you, everyone. And for organizing. And such. Cool. Have a good one. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.